All right, hi everyone. Uh, welcome for welcome uh, to the webinar, and we've got uh, Jay Ruane here, and I'm Maddie Martin. My video is not working, so I apologize for that. Um, but feel free to chat in and say hi. And uh, if you are a member of the Maxim Lawyer Facebook group, or how you heard about this, and maybe things you're looking to. Uh, get uh to learn during this webinar marisa hi this is all because of you so um thank Absolutely. you for the prompt yeah this is going to be a great presentation i'm really looking forward to it uh a lot of questions are a good thing so the more questions you have the better <laughs> hey everyone um so yeah we are going to go through some examples um I will say that we have two hours blocked off for this. I would be really surprised if we take the whole two hours, probably more like an hour, but we will leave that to, you know, some of the questions that are coming through, we'll answer as many as we can. Hey, Justy, hey, Nancy, hey, Devin. Um, yeah, well, Jay, Jay was talking. Um, Jay, say something. Devin, can you hear him? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Let's see if we can get thumbs up or yeses, if you can say, I see, I can. Here, Jay, give me a uh, give me a chat. <laughs> okay, great, Marisa. Okay, confirmed. Thanks, guys. <laughs> uh, awesome. All right, so uh, let's get started. Just a brief introduction. Just one housekeeping note: um, you will be able to view the slides that we have here if you go to the link that's on this screen that I'm showing you right now. So it's just bit.ly slash f b dash m c dash four dash lawyers so facebook mailchimp for lawyers um and just a little bit about me um i am head of growth and education for smith ai i have now been the head of marketing partnerships um a lot of growth programs and development for three tech startups um, for the last 12 years, I've really focused on digital marketing and communications and have for the last um, two and a half years been with Smith AI. So Jay, you want to say a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Jay and I'm a criminal defense lawyer in Connecticut uh, who happens to have a passion for digital advertising. It all started uh, about 21 years ago when I um, threw out a shingle, called the phone book people and said, I need to place an ad. And they said, the phone book closed last week. You won't get an ad for the next year. And I freaked out, uh, turned to uh, my brother, who had just taken a, a beginner uh, HTML class in college and said, let's build a website because otherwise I'm going to go broke before I even start. So I've been doing digital marketing for 21 years. Uh, I, uh, a lot of people in the community know me. Uh, if you want to talk marketing, I'm, all, I'm always willing to speak, uh, speak to you because it's my passion. Uh, I'm the co-author of Tiger Tactics, a number of other books. And just last week, we launched a social media marketing agency for lawyers called FirmFlex. And uh, some of the people here are members of the FirmFlex community, and we love uh, having you there. So that's a little bit about me. Awesome. Thanks, Jay. So let's just talk really quickly about the goals and objectives. And just one thing that I'll say here, like we're using Livestorm for this session, but maybe in the future we'll use Google Hangouts or something where people can kind of like chime in more with your own voices and on video. But for right now, any questions, just another housekeeping note, any questions that come up, feel free to just type them in. If we can, we will try to get to them all. If not, um, we will address them via email. Um, and Jay and I both have our contact information at the end of the slide deck. So just another housekeeping note there. So big picture here, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about lead funnel basics and what it means to be converting through, um, you know, repeat multi-channel messaging. Um, hey, Carol. <laughs> and uh, basically focusing just for today on MailChimp and Facebook, but a lot of the things that we're gonna be talking about will apply to whatever email system you're using. It just so happens that MailChimp is really robust in terms of the integrations that it has built in and with uh, Zapier, just because it is one of the most mature 
email marketing solutions out there. It's been around for a really long time. Obviously, Facebook is very mature. So we're kind of talking today about two very capable systems. So how to connect them is the first thing. Then how to kind of pass contacts back and forth or generate them from Facebook to MailChimp, MailChimp to Facebook. And then creating audiences based on your current audience in MailChimp that look similar in Facebook. And Jay is going to be talking a lot about what lookalike audiences are, how they can take shape, and different benefits of using lookalikes that are more or less similar to your client or lead base right now. Then we'll talk about actually ad campaign basics and best practices. We'll talk about creating emails and some examples of them, if it's a one-time or if it's a sequence, and then kind of summarizing how you can use these two systems to improve your lead funnel and conversion, following up on the back end with new session topics um, as we kind of go through the discussion today, like what comes to mind, what is this kind of trigger in terms of other topics you want to learn about? Um, and you don't have to tell us now. You know, you can also mention later on via email or even in the Maxim Lawyer Facebook group different things that sort of this um, this brings up that you'd like to learn more about, and we're happy to host those. And it doesn't have to be us, but we could definitely, I think, between you know Jay, me, and the group here, identify people who are experts that we can make sure are in touch with you if we can't deliver the advice ourselves. Absolutely. So lead funnel basics um, and focusing on the highlighted topics right now, really like when we talk about web leads, we talk about this generation, capture and conversion process. So where are they coming from? Are they coming from paid campaigns, from social media? from content, maybe you're, you're writing or you're producing infographics or videos? Are you building um, your website with uh, the SEO best practices in mind? Um, and then also generating backlinks and reviews and awareness through content from clients and peers that are helping to build your brand online. Then when a lead contacts you, you know, are they using phone, email, website chat, text messaging? Even though I have email highlighted here, actually, at the end of the presentation, we kind of talk about if you're bringing people to your website or using these channels, um, you know, hand in hand, you'll often find that phone, chat, text, like these communication methods do become relevant here. It's not just, you know, capturing emails and new subscribers for your MailChimp list. Like what are you doing with them? How are you engaging them? And, and how are you building your list? And then what is the communication that they prefer that also you're responsive on? And then who is responding? What are they doing when they respond? So are you filtering leads? Are you using Facebook targeting to using the information that you have on who best engages with your brand and the clients that you're most looking to engage with? Um, how are you qualifying them with questions and content that help to identify the best potential clients who are in your sort of reach? And then if we're doing intake, and nurturing for people who may not convert immediately, the role of these lead nurturing drips when they are first learning about your firm and determining, is this the right lawyer for me? How do you then use email as part of that to automate and really hand off that communication to your MailChimp or to your system? And then how does that end up resulting in a conversion? If it's not a well-qualified lead, um, oftentimes, you know, there are emails that go out that say, you know, we're not the right firm for you, but here's our recommendation. Maybe that happens by phone as well. So using email as a platform for communicating or for confirming maybe what happened on the phone 
if you talk to someone who wasn't a good fit and you want to make sure that it's clear in writing that you're not the lawyer who's working with them. So let's talk about how to's. If you already have a MailChimp account, and I'm pretty sure that everyone here has a Facebook account, uh, we're all in that same community together, it is really easy because MailChimp has built a native Facebook integration. There actually aren't that many, there's only really like six or seven that are built into MailChimp, but it's nice that you have a one-click login where basically you sign in through Facebook and as long as you are an admin of your Facebook page, you will be able to integrate your Facebook page with your MailChimp account. It's at the account level, not at a list level. But then once you've done so, you can actually choose which list to connect your Facebook page to back in MailChimp. So that means I can actually pick, let's say my general audience list. Uh, these are not existing clients. I wanna make sure that people are signing up for updates for let's say my law firm. And then I'm going to say on the Smith AI page, create this list and then actually it is automatically added as a new sign up form tab. So you don't even need to engineer your Facebook page. You actually automatically will see, I mean, it's really instantaneous. Um, once this is added, then you'll see a sign up page on Facebook. And you can design it better. I'm sure that Jay has plenty of advice around how to make this nicer because if you look at the first screenshot on this page, you'll see, okay, post photo, photos, video, email, sign up. That's sort of like the default look of, of a gray background with an email form. Obviously it look, can look prettier than that, but that is a one click sort of subscribe option that you can add instantly into your Facebook page. Now you probably, when you're connecting Facebook and MailChimp, won't be driving to this sign up form on Facebook itself because you can actually use MailChimp in more sophisticated and arguably much prettier ways. So the beautiful thing about MailChimp is that it's really not just, as of I think like maybe six to nine months ago, Jay, but like they added landing pages. And yeah, they're to really, me, that's they're really such a trying nice to take feature. over. They're really trying to take over the make it one stop shopping for uh, for conversion marketing uh, on on digital space. It seems to me like that is where they are heading as a product is to try to uh, go where the eyeballs are, which obviously for the most part is Facebook, uh, and provide a, a, a platform so that people can avoid using multiple different resources and people can focus on their platform, keep them in, in their family and allow them to uh, springboard and do a number of things. I mean, now you can even send postcards out to your MailChimp list uh, through you know, hard snail mail. Um, so they're, they're, really, they're really pushing the envelope for uh, marketing platforms to try to keep it all in their ecosystem. Yeah, that's, that's a word I like to use a lot too, is the ecosystem. It's really nice also for subscribers because the unified design of, and the familiarity of, you know, being within, um, you know, a platform where the emails are all sent similar templates, similar landing pages that look like your templates. I'll get into that in a second. Also with the, the ads that look like your emails and, and Jay will get into that too with like building campaigns. But the, the idea that you are repeating imagery to the audience on Facebook and MailChimp is really important for that instant brand recognition. So what you can do with, you know, connecting your Facebook contacts to MailChimp, because often the issue with Facebook is that it feels like you have this huge audience, but you don't have their emails, right? Like you're not able to export all of your followers as emails and just, you know, dump them into MailChimp. So how do you get that opt-in? Well, the really nice thing is that when you create 
ads and when you have content and when you actually directly request people to sign up for your you know list or for a free download you can use mailchimp to build a landing page they even have beautiful templates for these that look great on desktop and mobile and you can customize your form fields so that they could either be a landing page like this water bottle example where maybe you're not saying subscribe for our free ceramics guide but like marisa was just sharing in the group the other day about her you know hurricane resource guide that would be the perfect sort of thing to build as a landing page here you can add some content to the page you could have instead of subscribe actually a download button or you could even have you know a subscribe button and on the next page that displays your free download link so there are a number of ways to sort of get people who are on facebook to give you their email address and the landing page is one of them now even more integrated with facebook is something called lead gen ads and basically facebook has developed a native lead ad that has a form built into it so the interaction is happening more directly on facebook and then you are getting the name and email um, submitted to you and then with a zap it goes into mailchimp so it doesn't seem necessarily as direct but arguably it's going to lead to a higher conversion rate because the entire interaction is happening on facebook and there's a little bit more legwork on your end to make sure that they get added to the right MailChimp list. But in the worst case, these are being captured as you know, individuals that you can export and then manually upload if you don't have Zapier. But this is a great way of having the entire sort of capture process happen right on Facebook with no um navigation off to a landing page and if i can jump in there just talk a little bit about lead ads um from a uh, budget perspective lead ads will be the most expensive ad unit you can buy on facebook so i don't recommend using lead ads until you are at the bottom of your sales funnel right um, because if you're going to start because the lead ad itself the algorithm that shows the lead ad is what Facebook is looking to give your uh, ad to the people who are most likely to execute whatever the lead ad calls for. If it's a click through, if it's a, it's a form submit for a download. And unfortunately, if you don't have sufficient people in your audience that have executed in a funnel format, they can't quantify and say, okay, this person is most likely to execute. I started running for myself lead ads, just blanket lead ads with no funnel um, in the first week it was available. And my lead ad cost per unit was $150 after 48, 48 hours. So I quickly turned it off and said, this is not a, a viable product for me. Um, of course, that was years ago when they first uh, created the lead ads. Um, and, and now I know a lot more about the, the Facebook platform and how it works, but you don't want to just start with a lead ad. You want to have an engaged audience that goes from cold to warm to hot to ready to uh, engage. And the people who are ready to engage, that's who you want to send those lead ads to. But it's really amazing how easy it is to create the lead ad, connect it through uh, Zapier and, and get it into your list properly tagged so you can continue to market to people. So it's a wonderful use of digital technology. Yeah, no, and absolutely. The, the Zapier integration, I also believe, allows you to select not only the list that it goes into, but also the group so that you are really properly tagging and assigning them to the right category that they fall into. Yes, yeah, I think when you set up the lead ad, you can actually have hidden fields that include the groups. So I think that's how you do it. But that's getting into the weeds and, and most of the people here don't need that just yet. <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the beautiful thing, um, you know, is that you can easily create 
audiences from your existing MailChimp list. It's a simple click of the export audience button when you're in the list. Um, and then within Facebook ads, as long as you have the manager for audiences, you basically just click on create a custom audience, select import from MailChimp. They're the singular email service that has this option, which is really a nice feature when you've got a lot of other things on your plate and you know, you're know you using MailChimp, this makes it as easy as humanly possible. You literally don't even have to export that audience that I just showed you. You actually can click the import from MailChimp button here, you sign into MailChimp, and then it gives you the options of which list you wanna import. And then because you've authorized it, you basically are able to have that entire audience in there ready for retargeting because these are people who are already signed on you know they've given you the permission to communicate with them and it can be a really excellent way of getting your content in front of them when they're not in their email inbox or even like for for all of us who are here we may have people who are uh, we may have people who are helping us manage our email inbox. Like I know there are folks who, you know, have assistants who go in and manage that. You may actually be, or your clients may be missing emails, but on Facebook, very, very rarely do you have someone that you've given your Facebook account credentials to, right? Like I give my team tons of my personal credentials and never my Facebook credentials. It's just not something that I do. So. The nice thing is, is that when you have this list, you can build ads just for them to make sure that communications with clients or with leads that are really timely, you wanna make sure get to them, are right in front of them personally and not going through their assistant or getting, you know, sometimes emails will go to spam. Um, it's really important that you build these ads to show up in their Facebook so they're personalized. And if they did see the email, you're using very similar creative so that you have that instant familiarity and recognition. So for example, we did a private sale for our live website chat and this was the same image that we used in the email header. So I wanna use the same image in my Facebook ad so that it's much more easily recognized. I don't just have the Smith AI icon, the logo, the word mark, but it's the exact same image. So there's a lot higher likelihood that it's going to be looked at and paused on and clicked through. Now, when I'm building this, and Jay can definitely speak more to the actual ad build, but I always have multiple ads with copy variations. Normally I start with, you know, uh, maybe half a dozen, get some data and then work on it more. I don't wanna throw out too much work before I have some idea of, of what's getting traction. And I really clearly name them so it's easy for me to see which are the ads that are great. I don't have to click in to know what I'm looking at. Um, I also have in here my Facebook pixel setup and a referral tag so that I can see in Google Analytics, I can see in my tag manager, all of the clicks that are coming from this campaign in particular, so that I can credit them back when I see, for example, that someone clicked an email, didn't take an action, and then later saw a Facebook ad, and then finally took an action. And in your case, that could be, you know, downloading that hurricane resource guide. It could be um, completing your lead form or scheduling an appointment um, 
or saying that they, you know, want to read more of your testimonials, whatever action that they take, you are able to track it as the source that brought them back to your site and then what action was next. So Jay, you want to talk a little bit about building lists? Sure. Um, so one of the wonderful things about uh, Facebook is just um, also, one of the most frightening things about Facebook, and as we have learned, it is just the massive amount of data they keep on all of us. So every time you have liked something, uh, every time you have engaged with something that goes into their virtual repository uh, of, a, of a server somewhere that says that Jay likes this or uh, John likes that, uh, and so it allows them to... Uh, really sort of segment you based on a, on millions of variables into different buckets. Uh, I know a couple of people um, have uh, remarked online recently that they're seeing ads from Amazon of some wildly divergent things. Like they'll show a lawnmower and a softball bat and then a book about uh, German history. And the reason why they're doing that is because those ads are in the Facebook ad system, but they're looking to create more data points on you. So they're looking to see if you've clicked on something. So what they do then is take those data points. And when you have uploaded your list of people, they say, okay, so now we're going to upload maybe a thousand or 2000 of your former clients. Their, their algorithm will start going in and start saying, okay, here are the common things that we find about them. And we can supply an audience of people that look like the people that are existing clients of, uh, of your firm. Uh, so it's a wonderful way. I mean, this is how um, the Trump campaign uh, was able to do a ton of social media marketing for the last election. Uh, and if you were not a Trump person, you saw none of that. But the people who were we're seeing tons and tons of that. Uh, so this data mining that they have is what they're able to use to sort of um, serve up. It's, it's one of the great things about Facebook. It's also one of the scarier things about it. Uh, but we're interacting with them for our firms on such a on a low level compared to some of the way some other people are using it that um, we're not going to be doing the things that are as nefarious as what uh, what Facebook would would maybe allow. So um, what we're basically looking for is creating something called a lookalike audience. So when, uh, when Maddie was talking about uploading your list, you were essentially creating a custom audience of former clients or custom audience of former non-clients, which is certainly something people who've reached out to you, you can keep a list of people who you chose to decline representing. Um, now, in the past, before they changed their terms of service, a lot of people were buying lists uh, and using uh, services like MailChimp to upload random lists of people. Um, I'm not going to confess to you all that I was one who did it, but you know it's possible if you were searching for a certain type of clientele, maybe they were licensed by the state as accountants and you wanted to target them, you could buy a list or download a list from your state, upload them to MailChimp, then use them to match people on Facebook. That, of course, it violates the terms of service that they've put into place now uh, in the last two years, but it's certainly something that uh, is possible to be done. Um, what we're talking about is taking your assets, the, the, the list of people that you've spoken to, and creating a lookalike from them. And the way we do that is to go into your ads manager. Um, in the top, three, uh, top corner, top left corner, you'll see the hamburger icon, and it'll have that you can click on asset library where you can see uh, the tab for audiences, and then you're just going to simply create an audience, right? And you click on that that tab, and it clicks create audience, and then what you're going to create is a lookalike audience. Now, if you see there, the custom audience is something that you would have already created with your uh, existing list that you uploaded, and what we're going to be doing is creating a lookalike audience from those parameters. Now, it's not something that's going to have instant, happen instantly. It's going to be something that you're going to have to give the Facebook uh, algorithm and the Facebook server some while to compile them. Uh, but you'll get a notification when it actually is done. So when you click on lookalike audience, they're going to take you to 
uh, this dialogue. And in this dialogue, you're going to decide where you want to get your stuff from. So for example, I've given a number of presentations to the New Haven Bar Association, and I continue to do that. I have in my MailChimp a list called the New Haven Bar List. So that is going to be my source. Now, here's where a lot of people get hung up on creating a lookalike audience. You can only select either countries or regions. We want to select the United States. Now you might say, hey, I'm Charlotte. I don't want to advertise to people in, uh, in Mississippi. I only want to advertise to people in, uh, in Alabama, right? The problem is, is that Facebook is looking for mass marketing. So they haven't gone in and allowed people to target on such a, a micro level as going to state or county. You're going to be able to do that down the line when you actually set up your ad. So for now, all you want to do is just select the United States as where you want to serve your ads. And then you'll click down at the bottom uh, and click on create audience. And then that will take you to uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, if you uh, go down after that, um, we're going to talk about uh, the, the three types of audiences I'm going to tell you to create, right? Now, you can have up to five different uh, lookalike audiences. I recommend three because we're not Coca-Cola. We're not dealing with, you know, 300 million people that are going to be in our audience. We have a generally smaller practice area that we're going to be targeting. And in that practice area, we're going to have an even smaller amount of people who might possibly be a part of what we're looking for. So I recommend having three audiences and your first is going to be a 1% match. Those are the, the highest level matches. We're going to have a one to two percent match and a two to six percent match. Now, if you have, if you are in a larger area, if you're in New York City, if you're in Atlanta, if you're in Dallas, uh, if you're in one of these places where you have a very large population of people, you might want to go to four uh, audiences and maybe do a six to ten percent match. Um, I personally would recommend staying six percent or below. Uh, I don't see, in my experience, that you get much a response. A 10% uh, match is, is, is still a pretty wide uh, variety of people. Uh, and what we're trying to do is create a lookalike audience that is best chance uh, to convert for you. Um, I would recommend, uh, not go, if you really want to be judicious with how you spend your money, I don't like to go over uh, and uh, oh, go over 2%, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, I agree. And yes, Carol, if you are trying to target a specific location abroad, would you follow the same steps but click that specific country? That's exactly it. Uh, so when you get to your country, you select your country, and then uh, you will also um, then when you're building your ad, you're going to have the ad that have the audience there that's limited to that country, and then you can further geographically restrict your uh, your ad set, uh, service uh, in in your ad build in your ad campaign building. So after you've selected your audience sizes, then Facebook will go to work creating your audiences. Um, and this is just something that I came up with. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to say, oh, looky, they're doing it. Oh, my God, it's below 1,000. This is because this is what you're going to see. It used to be, it used to be before January of, uh, uh, of this year that uh, MailChimp would tell you exactly how many people were in your audience. And it was awesome because you could then see hey, I've got 4,300 people. And you knew if people started uh, interacting with your ad, you'd get an idea of what your, uh, what your spend and what your reach were and that type of thing. After the last election, with everything that happened with the Trump campaign, uh, they sort of removed those metrics. So you can't see specifically how many people are in your audiences, um, but you can, get, uh, you can get groupings in the tens of thousands uh, for your lookalike audience. So when you do your lookalike audience, uh, from the, uh, for example, from the New Haven bar list, uh, everyone's going to start below a thousand. And then in a couple of days, what we'll do is we'll actually be able to go back in and we'll say, okay, this one is under 10,000. This one is, you know, under 25,000. This one's under 50,000. So we get an idea of the uh, expansiveness of each audience when we're, when we're building our ads. So next up is like, this is what I, one that I've done for, um, for almost two and a half years now. I created a lookalike audience for my clientele. Just at two percent of people who needed tar uh, pardons. Uh, now, people who need pardons are people who have criminal convictions uh, in the state of Connecticut. I created that audience and then I put it on, and we've been working off of this audience of uh, 3.9 million people now 
steadily for uh, for a couple of years because uh, as we've served ads to them, they've converted at a very high rate. Um, now the audience itself is 3.9 million, but then when I further geographically restrict it to the state of Connecticut, it's under 50,000 people. Uh, but those 50,000 people are highly, highly engaged. Any questions about where we're at so far? Put them in the chat box and I'd be happy to answer them as we go, like I did with Carol. Maddie, do you have anything to add to this so far? Yeah, one thing I would just add is that you also have the ability once you start serving ads to further refine your audience. There are sort of demographic stats that you'll get on gender, age, you know, different breakdowns of the audience that are engaging with the specific ads and ad sets that you will be running. And then you can use that to sort of best inform your targeting up at the top of the funnel. So that's one thing that's really nice. You can also um, determine how often you're repeating ads to the same audience because you may look at an audience size of 4 million here and say, oh my gosh, my budget will never get me the exposure. Well, let Facebook run the algorithm that it knows to deliver the ads to those people and to those most like them who are most likely to engage. And then also consider ways that you know you want to restrict based on the ads that you're delivering. And this is, we're talking about the audience here, but when you go and actually build the ad, the really nice thing is that you have the option to further refine your audience and also the device and type of display that you're putting it on. So if your audience is really engaging with you on Facebook and it's mostly desktop or it's mostly mobile, or you see really in high engagement on specific areas within Facebook, like within the marketplace or Messenger, for example, um, then you're able to drill down into certain channels where you have the best chance of reaching the audience based on knowledge that you may have that Facebook doesn't necessarily have. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so now I wanna talk a little bit about dog whistles. And everyone, whenever I bring this slide up at any uh, social marketing uh, event, people look at me kind of strangely and they say, what the heck does a dog whistle have to do with uh, marketing on any type of social media? And the reality is this, a dog whistle is something that a very specific audience will react to. The audience for a dog whistle are dogs. But you and I would not hear that. Cats won't hear that. Squirrels won't hear that. Dogs react to dog whistles. And so when you are building your content, when you're building your ad, I want you to think along the terms of what are dog whistles that I can send out there and start to see what people are reacting to. Uh, and, that's, and that's really going to help you identify and create uh, ads that are natural for people to engage with. So if the dog whistle theory is basically, you're going to put out a bunch of different ideas in your first run of ads. Uh, but as you are seeing people engage and respond, and as you're watching your data come in, you're going to be able to say, okay, so this dog whistle is this piece of content. I got, you know, 40% higher engagement from men from 20 to 35. Well, now I know the next time I do something about this content, I should really target men 20 to 35 because they're the ones who respond most to this content, this image, and that type of thing. So in reality, that's the way I want you to think. You should be putting out multiple uh, concepts and seeing who responds to one and then use that uh, very broad information to target people. I've gone so far as to start running ads with just a dog whistle product just to see who engages with it. And then after that, we can start sending targeted audiences. So think of a dog whistle when you are trying to put together things to see what resonates with people. You know, a person who has a family law practice, if they put out something about how to deal with talking to your kids about divorce, well, as a single guy, you should be excluding them. But as a family with no children, 
you should you should be recognizing that they're not going to respond to that because it doesn't react they, they don't have any reaction to that so it lets you segment your population uh even better jay now, just one thing that i'll jump in here because it really like reminds me like the dog whistle is something that is secretly like the tip of an iceberg that i think is so important and probably warrants like another discussion we could do days on dog whistles i mean but one of the things that is so key there that you're that you're getting at is also making sure that you're hitting the right pitch and sometimes it has to do with the actual content that you're using you could have a ton of variations and they, if they're all internal language, because I know like being in tech, you know, being in law, like we have this vocabulary that is sometimes so much more advanced than that of the clients themselves. And you may find that like, if I say, you know, web chat, someone may have no idea like what I'm really talking about. Like, what is that? What's a receptionist or what is, what does this mean for me? Like, what is, does the person who need, who needs a pardon know that it's called a pardon or do you also as exploring content need to explore the full range of vocabulary that you're using maybe, but also that your customers are using and that can not only inform really great advertising that resonates that they connect with instantly because you're speaking their language maybe it's not the proper language but it's their language but it can also be a feedback loop to every other place where you have content and marketing channels online it can inform you know the way that you write copy for your website so these things that we're talking about here like if you're running and this is something that can happen if you're using, you know, um, outsource teams and you're not really looking at the data together and informing how it informs your firm's total marketing strategy. But if you have like ads that are running and you see something performing, one of the things that we always do is say, how do we translate this back to the other ways that we're selling or marketing? Like if something's working on Facebook and you see that copy works really well, are you taking that win and using it in other channels where you also need to use similar language? Yeah, I, I agree. You know, it's funny. I had a, a situation recently where somebody was asking me for information on uh, personal injury cases down in the South. And the first thing I said is, well, I looked at your website and you never say car wreck. You say car accident. And I said, the people down in the South call them car wrecks. They don't huh. say car accident, which is a New, New England thing, a Northeast thing. Um, and it was because they had hired somebody up in New York to do their website. That New York person didn't know and just used what was colloquial to them. Um, so you really have to think along those terms. Think about your audience and how they engage with things uh, when you're writing copy, even, uh, even on social. Great point. Okay, so next up for best practices, a couple things I wanna talk about um, just, just briefly. I cannot stress enough, and this is somebody who's been through this and screwed it up plenty of times. Take time to truly name things properly as you set it up, because it's going to help you tremendously down the line when six weeks later or six months later, you want to look back at something and you want to be able to remember what it was. If you are just clicking through because you're so excited and you want to get to the payoff where you can place that ad by, um, you're going to get to a point where you're going to have a ton of a ton of ca uh, campaigns that are called 18 plus uh, because you haven't set up the names properly. So do in every situation you can where they give you something to name. I want you to make sure that you are uh, that you are using your naming conventions properly. And really, what you need to do before you start any of this is sit down and create a system for your naming conventions because. As you grow, and we're all solos and small firms here, you might bring on someone to help you in your marketing, or you might outsource something in your marketing. And if you have a system for a naming convention, that will help them understand your product uh, placement, and it will help them understand how you logically set things up uh, and, and get the results out of it. So that's certainly something uh, that you're going to want to do. Um, one thing I would recommend that uh, um, certainly is, is certainly your mileage may vary. I don't like to build lookalike audiences in the 
uh, in my campaign as I'm building the ads. I want to sort of narrowly focus my audiences in one category uh, and then go back and use those audiences as a custom audience. Uh, I just find that if you're building the ad and you're also then trying to create a lookalike audience at the same time, it, it, you can do it. It just adds more steps to the ad creation process. And when you add more steps, it gives you more opportunities to, to screw something up. So what I recommend doing for best practices Go into your audiences tab, build the audience. Then when you're building your ad and you want to use that audience, go to custom audiences and select the audience that you uh, created. Um, so that's certainly something that, uh, that I highly recommend when you're doing it for best practices. Um, and then this is how I just visualize setting up a campaign. This is how we do it here in our office. We create the campaign name. We go to ad set one and you can have different ads within the ad set. Um, and here's where I want to talk a little bit about customization of the ads. Facebook is wonderful in that you can identify genders, you can identify ethnic ethnicities. So if you're going to be creating an ad set and you're going to be serving it to Hispanic women, use Hispanic women in the ad image. If you're targeting families, Use families. If you're targeting um, single African-American males as part of where you want to go with it, use pictures of single African-American males in your images. That's the wonderful thing about Facebook is that you can really identify the people you want to target and then show them an image that mirrors them so they are more inclined to click through on something. I guarantee you, if it's, if it's something that um, is uh, a dog whistle to a Hispanic female and she sees a Hispanic female in the ad, she can identify with that person. She is more likely to click through. Um, and that just goes back to simple uh, image psychology. So best practices are you have one ad set and then depending on where you're targeting the ad, make sure you have people in your ad that match the thing. If you're targeting an Asian audience, use photographs of Asian people in your images. Um, it, it really sort of amps up the engagement when you give people. That's why, you know, one of those most famous commercials of all time is that Coca-Cola, I'd like to teach the world to sing. It was a catchy song, but the thing that resonated with people wasn't necessarily the song, was that there was literally one person in that ad for everybody in the world, right? And so everybody could attach themselves to that song and say, somebody in that looks like me. Well, you don't have to do one ad that is seen a billion times, but like Coca-Cola did, you can have literally an individual ad for that group of a thousand people that really speaks to them. And so I would recommend uh, if you're going to do any sort of advertising, really spend some time thinking about the imagery that you're using. Uh, if you're going to be using uh, the images, either ones that you create or ones that uh, you get from stock resources. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Maddie, who's going to continue talking about creating a MailChimp email. Thanks, Jay. Um, yeah, so I don't want to do too much of a brain dump here. And maybe after this, you can say what you want to learn more about and we can dial into more specific topics because I know this can start to feel overwhelming. We're talking about, you know, both creating ads and creating emails here. But frankly, a lot of the content is similar and a lot of the approach is similar, um, especially with email um, sort of bandwidth and attention span being lower and lower. You know, emails are not massive long scrolling things as they used to be. So I'll go through just a few things that um, I think are really essential with MailChimp as like a quick hack. So um, one of the really nice things that you can do is you can not only set the subject line, but also the preview text in MailChimp. So here I've got my subscribed contacts. Obviously, I'm not contacting people who are unsubscribed. And I'm personalizing the two names. So it's, you know, first and last. I have it coming from the brand they recognize, obviously. And it's coming from an email address that can receive replies which whenever I get an email these days and it's something that I can't reply to, I think like, what the heck? 
Um, like how is how is that like user friendly? Um, so it's always something that can receive replies and a human being is actually staffing many humans in our case. Um, humans are staffing like those that reply inbox. Now, when it comes to the subject line, you can use emojis in MailChimp, they make it super easy. Um, and you can use a short subject line that is really under 10 words is like the best practice thereabouts, even less honestly, because people are viewing it on mobile and you don't want it to be cut off. But the preview text is a really nice hack. And if you're not using it, I encourage you to do so because it gets that extra line in the inbox so you can put out more content and more attractive copy to get the person to click into the email itself. Now, the nice thing is, is that MailChimp has templates, so you don't need to hire a designer or pay extra to create these campaigns. You can use one of their templates, and in any of these that you see here, they're all totally customizable. So drop in your brand, grab an image from Unsplash that's totally free Creative Commons, um, and then you can change any of the imagery to match with your brand colors. You can change the font. You can drag and drop things around. And even for really like a design, you know, dummy like me, like I really am not design minded, I can create something that looks decent and it allows you to, and thanks Jay for posting that about Mail Bakery. Um, Custom templates are great. Get started. Don't let that be the reason why you're not sending emails is because it has to be perfect. I really encourage you to do something that looks good and refine it over time because the user is never going to be as sensitive to things like that as you are. If the button click works, that's the important thing to make sure. If the color is something that you're refining over time, you know that's something you're gonna be sensitive to and they're probably not gonna notice. Now, when you are building your MailChimp campaigns, one of the things that we've noticed, and this has been trial and error, and it, it was initially painful, but now we've determined that under settings and tracking, there is an option for using conversations to manage replies. For some reason, when this is checked, the emails are much more likely to be flagged by Gmail in particular as spam or as caution and you get that yellow banner over your email. It is like the ugliest thing to have happen to your otherwise beautiful, very well targeted, easily delivered email that should have no problem because the person opted in to your email. So I really recommend not checking that box and to just have the replies come into your inbox and don't do this little fancy setup that they have. It's not worth it. Um, definitely be tracking opens and clicks. And if you have a cart on your website, which some attorneys who are doing flat fees and subscriptions do, um, then you can add in even e-commerce link tracking that'll give you the cart value from your campaigns and how valuable they are in converting. You can connect it to Google Analytics as well so that you know if you have goals set for certain um, actions that people take on your site, maybe they download a free resource um, like Again, Marisa's, you know, uh, hurricane resource guide, that's something that you can set as an event or a goal, and then you'll have your data synced so you know where that original lead came from. It came from maybe a Facebook lookalike, and then it came into your mail list, and they engaged, and finally they converted. So you'll see that whole sort of path of a new potential client. Now, the really nice thing about MailChimp also is that it can automatically put people not only in lists, but also in lists that have drips. 
So it's really easy to set up a single one-off email. And you'll see here, this is actually the email that we sent that's very similar to that Facebook ad that I showed you. But we may also have something like, hey, by the way, you know, we, we also observe federal holidays or here's my monthly newsletter. And it could be one-off or it could be a different email every month. But the difference with a drip is that it's a sequence that happens until someone moves into a different category. So let's say that we have someone who, in Smith AI's case, they signed up for live website chat, they haven't put it on their website yet, they're running these Facebook that campaigns, they're running, uh, they're paying a lot of money for organic search, they've added car wreck and car accident and all those synonyms to their website. They're doing everything that Jay's told them to do. And then they're like, oh, well, we better get chat on our website too. So we see that they sign up for chat. And then what happens? They haven't finished the installation. Or they download your white paper, or they sign up for a list, or they give you their contact information in a form. And then they're really hard to reach, but you have their email. So what do you do? You have nurturing drips based on what you know their initial engagement was. In this case, it's chat. We're not talking about our receptionist. And then we have drips that go out. Maybe it's once a week. Maybe it's once a day. You have to determine here. I've got a loose bullet on the bottom here. Sorry. Um, now, you have to determine what is the best timing for your practice. If it's criminal defense or personal injury, you better believe it's going to be a lot faster decision making process on average than someone who is looking at, you know, maybe a state or business law. They're looking to start up a new business or trademark, or maybe they're thinking about getting a divorce. Whatever the case may be, there are different decision making times based on practice area very often. And that should inform your marketing strategies and your lead nurturing strategies. So, as we're looking at the different opportunities to communicate repeatedly, not only are you saying, Oh, here's a reminder, you probably got busy or we'll, we're still here for you, but also things that help to build your brand and trust based on what you know about how informed this audience is. Are these an audience of personal referrals or are these an audience of Facebook lookalikes? If it's more the latter and they're not so familiar necessarily with your brand, it would be a very good idea to show them proof of uh, testimonials and positive reviews, your expertise, awards, your history, things that indicate your track record. So then you have the ability to be following up with them in a way that is automated so that you can continue practicing law during the day and not just messing around with all the things that Jay and I are talking about, which I'm sure at this point in the webinar seemed like it could take all day, every day to just run the, the Facebook and uh, ads and, the, and the email programs. So you don't want to get to a point where it's like consuming all of your time, but you do want to take the time to set it up once, test it and have it run so that when you're paying for those ads and that exposure to your firm, you have the peace of mind of knowing that the follow-up, at least by email or if you use a service to you know, call them back and follow up, that's happening in a systematic way. So. I got one last thing to say yeah. about um, something that people should consider. And it may take a little bit of effort but it's not that hard. One of the things that MailChimp can do, and it actually could make uh, delivery and engagement look really good if you're going to be running a drip, especially if you're going to be running a drip to people who have opted into your services, but maybe not necessarily converted for you yet, is that you can actually send a plain text looking email by coding your own HTML. I'm going to add to the chat a, uh, a website that I found 
um, that uh, gives you step-by-step -step instructions on how to uh, do that. Um, and essentially what you do is you make it look like it's actually coming from a real person sitting at a desk yep. because it looks like an email that they sent out. So you don't have to throw in your logo. You don't have to throw yep. in anything fancy. And so when they get it, it looks like somebody is uh, actually taking a moment to send them a, a, a direct email. You can make your signature look the same as it does on your email. So that's a wonderful sort of hack that you can use when it comes to MailChimp because you aren't forced to use their templates. You can actually code your own HTML. Uh, and the link that I put up on the side there is a uh, very, very minimal um, MailChimp template that you can drop in, add a few things you, like your information, your practice area, et cetera, and make it look like you're sending an email directly from your email client um, to them, uh, although it's all automated. So it's a wonderful thing that you can do um, to sort of trick the mind when they uh, open it up that they think it's actually coming from a real person and not uh, from a program. So that's a hack that I'll just throw in there for people to use if they want to go to uh, like level two MailChimp, uh, MailChimp stuff. It's so true. It's actually um, with the tests that we've run, Jay, like very often those outperform in open rate yeah. and click rate and reply rate than the fancier emails. And especially for people who are in solo and small firms, yeah. it feels much more in line with expectations, I think. Um, so when it looks like a personal email, that's sort of what they're expecting when they, you know, are, are thinking of a, a solo or, or small firm with just one or two partners. Yeah, we had a snow day uh, last year, uh, and we quickly ripped, uh, put together a one of these um, very plain text looking email. We sent a nine word email out to our list of a of a couple hundred people who were sort of on the fence about hiring us, uh, and the nine word email converted something like thirty or forty clients that day. Uh, as everybody was sitting around. So it was a wonderful thing to do. Uh, but that's subject for another webinar we can do down the line. I love that you just said that, Jay, because I literally have a nine word email template in like our law firm communication playbook. It is a brilliant, simple approach. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so, you know, how does, how does MailChimp and Facebook combine convert leads now? It just increases your expo exposure. It's like, more impressions if you have in a google search page your website showing up twice in two positions what does it do it's more likelihood that you're going to get a click on one of them than if you just had one so if you're on facebook and if you're also in their email inbox it is just increasing the likelihood that they're going to see your message and seeing your message as long as the message is good and it's targeted and ready for them hopefully it will yield an increase in conversion rate that's very funny marisa well yeah. you know you obviously have an amazing resource here jay who works on many of these things and there are many other folks in the um maximum lawyer facebook group um who do run you know social media and, and other marketing campaigns but i mean jay's right here so um i think yeah, he's I'm a, demonstrating I'm a his expertise <laughs> I'm a nerd, but it comes from me being, number one, being cheap, and number two, me realizing I need to know this stuff so that I can make my business grow. Uh, I mean, right. I, I can, I can, I let you behind the scenes of my MailChimp campaign. Now it's firing and it's, it is looking great. Some of the things I created in templates years ago are some of the ugliest underperforming things you'll ever see. And it just comes by trial and error. Yeah. And I think, you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel when you have people to reach out to, you know, like you, Jay, and others in the group who can say, you know, I tried that and it didn't work for me, but here's what worked. And if you hear that enough times, you know, then, then you are not, you know, trying the same things that other people have tried and didn't work for them. You're starting and you're hitting the ground running. And I think that's what I really like that you're doing Jay at FirmFlex is like, just here's the tried and true. Like I've been through the ringer and like, why do you have to go through the ringer too? Um, now, when we talk about, you know, tracking, it's super important that if you're going through this work, you also, just like you're setting your campaigns up with good naming conventions, that you're also setting good habits for tracking. So if you're launching campaigns and you're not spending at least one day a week 
just not one full day, but some time once a week to look at the performance of your campaigns or for someone on your team to be dedicated to doing so, you really are doing yourself a disservice by spending money and not necessarily taking action based on what's working and reallocating funds to those things that are working and doubling down on your tests of the things that are working. So looking not only at, you know, click through rates and visibility of your ads and your emails, but also who from those emails and which audience did they come from is actually signing up for more information on your firm or booking appointments with you or becoming clients. And are those clients you want more of or are those clients that you sort of wish you didn't get? And how does that inform as a feedback loop back to the audience that you're targeting? If you want to make sure that you are pinpointing who is reaching you, it's not just about using a URL parameter, and Google has a really excellent URL builder, but also using dedicated numbers for calls and texts. Because if someone just goes to your website and they call your main line, it's very hard to determine when and how they heard about you and tracking it back to the original source. So if you can have dynamic number insertion on your website, which just means a different number displays that is trackable by calls or if they click to call from their phone. And you'll know, even though it's routed to your main number and it rings to you the exact same way without delay, that that number they used was only on the landing page that came from a specific campaign. And that allows you to make really good decisions at really almost like negligible amount of extra money. You're going to pay like, you know, $5 a month to add a number to your VoIP phone system. Um, Zip whip if you don't have texting enabled, add texting so that people can contact you in a way that they are most comfortable with and you're not sort of blocking any communications that come from your campaigns and that you're maximizing your ability to be responsive on the channels that they prefer. So in terms of your game plan, think about those dog whistles, about what's gonna attract people, and then set up these campaigns with copy that addresses what content resonates most. Um, get FirmFlex is Jay's new FirmFlex um, business, and he's got a ton of ideas. If you just want some you know, more inspiration, and not feeling like you're starting from scratch. Jay, do you wanna talk about that a little bit more? So well, yeah, I mean, really what FirmFlex is, it came to me after leaving Match LawCon and watching some Real Housewives. Um, I was intrigued by uh, Teddy Mellencamp's uh, personal coaching, uh, where she said that the most important part of her personal coaching practice was the daily accountability. And I, and I said to my wife on the plane back, you know, I'm good at social, but I really need daily accountability to get it done. So when we came back to the office, we, we tried to develop a system in our office for to get all the lawyers posting on social and, and making accountability happy for them, happen for them. And uh, what we found was a system that really worked. It, it seems a little counterintuitive that you're not going to be always telling people about what you do for your practice, but by, uh, by you know, doing proper SEO for social, which is social engagement optimization. Um, what you can do is, is get more people responding to what you post. And as you post these crazy things like salami day uh, and, and uh, things about cheese pizza or uh, teddy bears or maps or whatever it is, uh, you're going to see what your audience is going to start to respond to. And then when you go to create that lookalike audience, you're going to say, okay, well, I know that these people respond to stuff about food, or they don't respond to stuff about food. And so you can tailor your ad copy uh, appropriately. So it's a real good way for you to sort of get an idea of what's gonna, uh, what your people are gonna respond to at a very minimal investment of five minutes a day. I love that, yeah. And I think the other thing that's so important here is that 
we do really recognize that you're running. I mean, I think as Marisa and Carol are getting at, you know, you're running a law practice. And if you're in court in the mornings or busy or in meetings or just want to be doing deep work without a ton of distractions, and yet people demand an instant response when they sort of come to your site and they want to make sure that you know, they have questions answered and they're interested and you want to capture them right at the time of intent before they go and explore another firm. How do you do that if you're busy? Like that's sort of where we're able to come in and say, not only are we at Smith AI able to answer your calls, but if you have people who are submitting these new forms, downloading resources, and you're getting their, their name and their phone number, or they're on your website, you can outsource these tasks to us so that we can be responsive on your behalf, at least do some qualification and make sure that they're a good fit for your practice. And then the next step for you is to, you know, make that scheduled consult appointment that they've booked. So hopefully it's not a huge burden on your time from a ton of interruptions and only the extra kind of communication tasks that come out of this are with qualified consults. So if you have topic requests that um, are marketing related and communications related, then please let us know. Our emails are here. I posted the link to the presentation um, in the chat and uh, we would be happy to share that with you. We're on LinkedIn, we're, we're obviously here by email. We're also obviously on Facebook and the Maxim Lawyer Group and just as individuals. So please get in touch. Um, as always, you know, we're here to be resources to you and thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much guys. Great hanging out. All right, take care. The recording will be sent to you after this webinar and you're welcome to share that with whomever would like it. Thanks, Maddie. Thanks, Jay. Take care, guys. Bye.